So thank you. Um, is the microphone on? Can you hear me in the back? Yeah? OK. So um, before I actually start doing anything today, I just wanted to say a little bit about the motivation for some of these problems. So Alexander talked about this yesterday a little bit. So much of this was really motivated by problems in, in, in models uh, for something like the, the two-dimensional Ising model models like that. And, and so the, the strong Zagel limit theorem really applies to the case where your temperature is below the critical temperature. And what Anzager showed is that if you, if you say fix a site, think of it just as the origin. So you have a big lattice, and, and if you, if you fix the spin, say, at the origin, and you look n units away, the correlation of that is a toplitz determinant, exactly. And so the asymptotics of the determinant, which we know now are a constant to the nth power times, a con times another constant, in that case, the, the g of phi that we talked about yesterday and today the, um, what we call the geometric mean was one. So that determinant just approached a positive constant. So that showed that there was correlation. So the spins were correlated. If you raise your temperature and you go to the critical temperature, then you're in the realm of the Fisher-Hartwig symbols. And for those, I mean, Michael Fisher, I'm, I'm, I think, was one of the main motivators of that problem, sort of understood that and understood this class of symbols were, were important. And as we'll see, as we've already seen from Alexander's talk, there you have different asymptotic behavior. And in fact, at the critical temperature, things die off like n to the minus a fourth. You can ask what happens above that temperature. Above that temperature, you actually have a symbol that has a lot of winding. And Neither, well, not me, but neither of us have really discussed that case. But in that case, things die off exponentially quickly. So that's just one example from that whole realm of problems where things just t sort of turn out to be a toplitz determinant. Here's another example. This is actually one of my favorite ones. If, again, you take a lattice and you... Um, and you think of uh, a, a dimer configuration. So you connect, you have an even number of points. You connect two adjacent points, either with a vertical bond, a horizontal bond, or a triangular bond. So everything has to have, everything has to be um, bonded. Everything has to, you have to join two points. And you ask how many configurations are there? And then you take two points away, again, maybe one at the origin, one down n units, and actually up one unit. You take two away, and then you ask the same question. That ratio is a toplitz determinant, except it has a matrix-valued symbol. So that's a very interesting problem. Um, and you can put weights on those bonds. So that's um, another one that's very much like the, the Anzager one. But there's also, in kind of buried in all of this, just one fundamental question. And it is, well, I'm going to contradict myself now. Because the very first day I said, we're looking at finite matrices. And it doesn't really matter. It kind of doesn't matter what Hilbert space we take or Banach space we take as, an, as viewing these as truncations of those operators. But what if you have an operator? You just have an operator. And, infinite dimensional operator, and you want to know something about it. You want to know its spectra. So if you take finite truncations, you can simply ask the question, does the spectra of the finite truncations 
go to the specter of the operator. Does that even make any sense? Or if the finite things are invertible, <coughs> is the bigger operator invertible and vice versa? So those questions are, are important in just approximation theory because you're approximating a big thing by a a sort of a truncation. So those, you know, those questions can somewhat be answered in these Toplitz cases. First of all, if you know the determinant, you know whether or not something is invertible. If you have an asymptotic formula that isn't zero, then that determinant is, is, tells you that the finite matrix, at least for large n, is invertible. So you can ask how these spectra compare. And those are, those are all very interesting and subtle questions. And the answer is things don't always work out like you think they should. So um, I'm going to leave that, but I just wanted to um, give some more motivation. OK, but I lost my picture. So um, just. Is it going to come back? Oh, yeah. OK. All right. So um, what I'm going to try to do today is uh, mostly, after I kind of finish up one thing about Fredholm determinants, sort of the same thing that Alexander did for fisher hartwig symbols. So we're going to try to get the asymptotic formula by using this sort of operator approach. However, I didn't quite finish yesterday. And yesterday, we had this proof in the um, strong Zagel um, setting where the symbol was very nice. And in that setting, um, I said that proof works in lots of other cases. It works in Toplitz plus Hankel. It works if you apply an analytic function to the Toplitz operator. And it also works for an integral operator. So I'm, I'm going to start there today. So. Um, we're going to look at the um, Fredholm determinant here, where T is the integral is an integral operator, and Fredholm defined this determinant a long time ago. And so, what you do is you have a kernel, your kernel K, and you define a determinant based on um, the values of K of x, x sub p, y sub q. So you form that determinant. And then you get a series representation for this, 1 minus lambda. So this is just going to be k of x1, x1. This is just going to be a 2 by 2, and so on. So we have an, an infinite series in general, unless k is finite rank. So um, Fredholm actually not only defined this determinant, he actually produced the inverse of the integral operator i minus lambda t, if it existed, by using a, a, a different series. And this was actually the denominator in the series, the spread home determinant. And this was all done just um, by using Kramer's rule, dividing up an interval, just sort of seeing what you get. And, and he, he actually produced something that gives you the inverse. So it tells you what the kernel is for the inverse of the operator. So this goes way back. So, um, so I want to first of all sh say that this series actually converges. So that's pretty easy. If you just have a bound m for your kernel, there's an old property of determinants that the absolute value of a determinant of a is less than or equal to the product of the norms of the columns. So useful, useful uh, inequality. Oh, and that last, that should be dot, dot, dot. There shouldn't be another in inequality there. So that says that each integrand of that, um, of the determinant of k of xi, xj, has absolute value at most m to the n times n to the n over 2. You just take the most basic, um, just, just replace each thing by m. And so each term of the series has a value at most, the absolute value of lambda to the n times b minus a. So this is going to work for a finite interval. b minus a to the nth times m to the nth, n to the n over 2 divided by n factorial. So if you just think about n factorial, 
you can see that th this converges for all lambda. So the Fredholm determinant makes sense. So it's an, I it's an entire function. It makes sense for all lambda. And it, you can, it can be shown that if lambda is a zero of d of lambda, then one over lambda is an eigenvalue of the operator t. That actually, Fredholm showed that. So this thing picks out the eigenvalues. So the set of non-zero eigenvalues is discrete and either constitutes a finite set or the eigenvalues have a limit point of zero. That's because these operators are compact if k is continuous on a finite interval, and so that has to happen. Okay, so we want to set this up in the same context as we did the Toplitz case. But in the Toplitz case, we used i plus trace class operators. Well, in the Toplitz case, we didn't have to worry about this first part because it was just an n by n matrix, so there was nothing to worry about. But what I want to make sure is that this definition agrees with the definition of I plus trace class. So we want to make sure that that's the case. So that's the first thing I'm going to verify. We have a Fredholm determinant, and then we have another notion of an infinite determinant. Are these the same? Okay. So um, I'm not sure why that is happening. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, and 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 I'm going to prove this in the case of interest, and that is in the Wiener Hopp case. So again, this is the case where our kernel is k of x minus y, and k is going to be given by. Um, this is just part of the hypothesis. The Fourier transform of a function sigma minus one. So this is the thing that's going to correspond to our symbol. So our symbol is not k for this. Our symbol is going to be sigma. OK, so it's defined on the real line. We assume that sigma minus 1 is L1. If alpha is infinity, if you go all the way to infinity, then this is what is sometimes thought of as a usual Wiener Hopp operator. And we'll denote this by w of, of sigma. OK. All right, so we want to make sure this is trace class, and this is pretty easy to verify in this case, because if you think about what you're integrating, you're integrating e to the minus x times e to the i, y, c, and one of those depends on x, and one of those depends on y. So what you have right there is a kernel of a rank one operator. That's all you have. So you think of y, as your variable that you're integrating, and then everything is just a multiple of e to the minus ix. So that's definitely trace class. It's rank one. And then the, that, the kernel is, a, is an L1 limit of sums, and that turns out to be the same as the L1 limit in the trace norm. So these are actually trace class operators, these integral operators, with the assumption that sigma minus one is an L1. OK, so the notions are the same. All right, so um, we now we have two definitions. We have d tilde, which is the determinant as a trace class operator. We have our Fredholm um, definition. And now you have to argue that these are the same. And one can do that. I'm not going to do that here. You can do an approximation by finite rank. For finite rank, it's, it's clear, because they have the same zeros. They're the same value at zero, and then um, you can extend that in general. OK, so let's keep going. Um, OK, so now if we go back and we think about our Wiener Hopp operator, um, so this is what this looks like. So we're sending f to the really the identity plus this um, this is a standard Wiener Hopp operator, so you can think of this lambda as minus one if you want, or you can incorporate the lambda into the k, it doesn't matter. But what convolution corresponds to multiplication in the transform space? 
So if you just think for a second about this operator, you're really taking f hat, multiplying by sigma, taking the inverse transform, and then just thinking of your answer as being on minus zero, uh, zero to infinity. So you're just doing a projection. So that's all this operator is. And so that is exactly the analog of the Toplitz case. We took a function, we multiplied, and then we projected. We kind of didn't mention transform because it was just the discrete Fourier transform. Here you, can't, you have to actually write it down. So this has the same structure. And in fact, the truncated operator, you're just putting projections on either side of the regular Wiener-Hopf operator. That's all you're doing. Okay, so this, so, so you, can just, you can just replace the right words in that proof, in this case, and the same proof works. And so here's, here's the answer. I'm not gonna do the proof because it's the same thing. Um, we, we have to make some assumptions. These are sort of the same Banach algebra uh, assumptions we had before. So K is in L1, it has to satisfy more or less that um, um, Sobolev condition two. Sigma has to be bounded away from zero, has index zero as you go across the line. And, and then the determinant, now this determinant is the Fredholm determinant or the one defined by the trace class, the same thing, is asymptotic to G of sigma to the alpha, it's the geometric mean in this case, times E of sigma, E of sigma is an infinite determinant because the proof's the same, and G of sigma uh, is defined in an analogous way. You take the log of sigma. Um, it's, it's really the, the zero value of the Fourier transform of log, right, and exponentiate that. So the proof's the same. You get the same result. So that proof works here too. Okay. All right. So let's leave that. Um, so now, this is the second part of what I want to talk about today, and that is to repeat uh, some of the stuff that Alexander said. And, and so this is sort of the operator theory version of the proof, um, and it's a version that kind of, it, it works. Um, in some ways, you don't, get, you don't get some of the very refined results that Alexander can get, but um, it's just another way to view it. And it's, it's sort of the way it was maybe done first, I think. I'm, I'm actually not sure about that. Okay, so just to repeat what he said, um, in 68, Fisher and Hartwig considered a class of symbols where you have something that's nice times these functions, which I'll call phi of alpha beta, but you can translate them, which, so the singularity is any place you like, and they're given by two minus two cosine theta to the alpha. That's just rewriting what he had. This is the way Fisher and Hartwig wrote the symbol. Times e to the i beta theta minus pi, theta between zero and pi. And real part of alpha, this is to make sure it's an L1 um, so that you can integrate the coefficients. Uh, real part of alpha is bigger than minus a half, okay? So, um, if you write, if you take the absolute value of z minus one, you end up with these, this cosine term. That's, that's the only difference. Okay, so, um, the, so, so Alexander mentioned this, and um, let me just say a little bit about the nature of these factors. So two minus two cosine theta to the alpha can have a zero. It can be unbounded if alpha is, say, as negative real part or has a singular, singularity of oscillatory type, say if it's imaginary. And the factor e to the i beta theta minus pi has a jump. So you can have a finite number of these sorts of factors on the circle. And, and I think as it was pointed out, so this doesn't satisfy our Banach algebra condition because of the growth of the Fourier coefficients. And so this is the singular case. So, um, okay, so, and in fact, um, the logarithms uh, have Fourier coefficients that are of the order one over K. So the constant in Zago's theorem doesn't even make sense for these functions. 
All right, so Fisher and Hartwig, going back to the history a little bit, conjectured that d of n of uh, psi was the same geometric mean, geometric mean of the nice part to the nth times n to the um, a power, the power is the sum of alpha sub j squared minus beta sub j squared times e star, and they did not really conjecture the value of e star. They, but they did conjecture the first two terms. Um, so the conjecture, here's the, the answer in the case where the conjecture works. So, you know, I thought just at least see the answer. So the answer first has e of phi, so that's the same thing we had yesterday, the determinant of t phi, t phi inverse. Then you take Wiener Hopp factors of phi plus and phi minus and evaluate them at those powers up here. So that is an interaction between phi and the singularities. And then you have a term right here that just involves the, the, the places where you have singularities and the powers. And then you have a product, uh, as was said for, for one of them, for, um, of these G functions uh, that depend on alpha and beta. So G of Z is the Barnes G function. It satisfies G of one plus Z equals gamma of Z times G of Z. I, I do have um, the um, product formula written out. Okay, so that is the actual product formula for G of one plus C. It's got, um, uh, you can see where the zeros are in the order of the zeros. Um, I pretty much already said this. Um, the, the factors defend, de, de, depend on phi plus and phi minus. Those are always, um, those are not unique because of the, they, you can put the constant part in either term. So here, the constant terms there are one. That's all incorporated into the geometric mean. And um, you're taking all those logs of those factors between minus pi over two and pi over two, the arguments, rather. So this answer is well-defined. Okay, so, um, so what I wanna do is sketch this now using sort of the operator, um, theory techniques, and um, it, this conjecture is sort of known in every case where it should be true. There's cases where it, it is not true. Um, I might not get to that today, but rather tomorrow, but, but I will mention that. Um, so I'm gonna sketch the proof in the case where you just have jumps, just because it's technically a little bit easier. Um, and the real part of beta j, this is important, or else <laughs> things don't work, is between a half and minus a half. So this is just jump. We're, for the purposes of this proof, we're taking away the zeros. Um, and that's because I'm going to do this uh, still with respect to the Hardy space, the proof. And if you if you go if you if you include other parameters, then you have to sort of change your underlying spaces and you have to use weighted spaces, and it, it becomes a little technically complicated, but the idea is exactly the same. In fact, you, you prove the same theorem, you just have to change the methods a bit. Okay, so this is only jump discontinuity. So here's, here's the idea, it's a pretty simple idea. First of all, um, if you have what we call just the pure singularity, so you have one singularity and you don't have, you're not multiplying by a nice function. Um, in this case, actually, the Toeplitz matrix is, is a Cauchy matrix. It's of the form one over a sub i plus b sub j. This you can, this is just a little exercise, just write down the Fourier coefficients of that function e to the i beta theta and integrate, and you get, you can see exactly what they are. So that determinant can be done uh, exactly, and you can get the asymptotics exactly. So you know how to do that one case. 
And as was said this morning by John and then also by Alexander, even if you have an alpha, the corresponding inter and, and you look at the determinant, that's the thing that corresponded to the Selberg integral. So that's one way to do it. You can actually do that other integral another way. Uh, due to Chava showed this. You can actually take the corresponding Toplitz operator and split it up into things that where the projections all come inside. So there's multiple ways to do that one example, but you can, you can do it. Okay, so we know how to do that. And we know how to do the nice case. So can we just piece those answers together? That's the idea. In other words, can we take, can we figure this out by knowing those two things? If you don't have common singularities, can you just piece things together? And the answer is yes, you can. And that's the way we're going to do this. OK. So, and we're going to use our very favorite algebra thing again. Um, and we're going to just look at the analog for finite matrices. So T of phi psi is T of phi T of psi plus H of phi H psi tilde. That's for the actual operators. For finite matrices, there's an analog, a very simple analog. And it just says this Tn of the product is the product of the Tns, plus exactly what you have up here with Pns, plus another term. And the other term switches the tildes. And, and the Wns here take a sequence, and they uh, chop it off and flip it around. So this is a flip. Okay, And again, you can prove this by just writing things out, and you'll see this works. OK, so can you get information from this simple identity? Can you piece things together? OK, so I just want to make a remark about W sub n, because P sub n converges to the identity pointwise, strongly. W sub n does not do that. W sub n only converges to 0 weakly. In other words, if you take W sub n applied to f inner product g, that tends to 0. That's just because if you take the basis elements, you can see that. For n big enough, that is 0. So this is actually the one little difficulty that you get into when you use this approach, because P sub n's, W n's don't do what P sub n's do. OK, but W Wn squared is Pn, because if you flip and flip again, you get Pn. Wn star is Wn. And here's something that is handy. If you, if you take Wns and put them on the sides of a topless matrix, it's the same thing as taking the, the tilde. And again, that just is an algebra effect. OK. So. Let's suppose that our finite matrices are invertible, OK, for a moment. And in this case, with those conditions, they actually are invertible. So if we just take that identity and divide by Tn psi inverse, Tn phi inverse, we just have something of the form In plus Kn plus Ln. And I wrote down Kn. Kn is right here. It's the Hankel part times these things with the pn's on either side. And the ln's are the same thing, but you have these kind of annoying wn's right there. OK, so that's what we have. Now, if kn plus ln converged to something in trace norm, you'd be absolutely done. You could write down your answer. But that's not what happens. You have to just do one little thing to fix that. It, the kn actually is kind of an easy part, but the ln has a problem because of the WNs, because you don't have strong convergence, and that's what you need. OK. So but we, we can get around that. And I'll show you how right now. <coughs> what I've not been able to do is get around that. OK. So um, what we know right now, though, is that we have that identity. And so we need to figure out how to get a limit here. 
Um, and there's another thing that you might be asking about because the product of Honkel's in the smooth case was trace class, but now that used the fact, if you recall, that phi and psi tilde were in that Banach algebra. We don't have that anymore because our symbols are not, they have these singularities. However, what we can always assume is that they don't have singularities in the same places, right? Because we have this product and the singularities are localized. Okay, so um, we need to worry about both of those things and we will. And so here's a little lemma that is <clears throat> not, again, not hard to prove. And it says, suppose we have just bounded symbols and we have a partition of unity, f and g, so f plus g is one, these functions are smooth, such that h of phi f and h of psi g tilde, those are both trace class operators, then this product is trace class. So the way that we're going to, we're going to separate these singularities enough so that we can write down something that's trace class. Okay, so to prove this, you just write this down. So you have h of phi, h of psi tilde is this difference, right? And you stick in an f plus g and an f plus g, and then you get exactly this. And then if you recall um, just our standard old algebra properties, the way we collapse the two toplets into one, you can collapse this and collapse it again, and the same here, and that'll cancel that. And you'll have the sum of a whole bunch of Honkels that you're left with. Some of them will be this, and some of them will be a Honkel, just a Honkel of F and a Honkel of G. That's all you'll have. Okay, but we have to make sure that these Honkel operators are actually trace class. So we need, to, we need to assume that off the singularities, there's a little bit more smoothness than we assumed before. So, um, so, so here's just to show you how you do this for H of F and H of G. You can actually turn these into trace class or show that they're trace class by, by writing them as a product, A times B, where you leave A alone, and B is just a diagonal matrix where it, ha it has K plus one to the minus three fourths on the diagonal. That's going to be Hilbert Schmidt. The other thing, because we're assuming that the coefficients are big O of K to the minus two, is also Hilbert Schmidt. You can check that. So therefore, um, you can show that these individual Honkels, that's what we didn't have before, the individual Honkels are actually trace class. So you need this sort of smoothness off the, off the, um, away from the singularities to get this to work. You can amend this. It doesn't have to be quite the same thing, but something like this. Okay, so now, now our term Kn is pretty good. So Kn is Pn times this, these Honkels, which we know are trace class times Tn psi inverse, Tn phi inverse. And what we want to say is that this converges to something in the trace norm. So the, the first part, the part on the left, the Pn product of Honkel's is fine. What do you know about the toplets, the finite toplets matrices? For this class of symbols, for these piecewise continuous symbol, symbols with the real part between minus a half and a half, it is known that Tn of phi inverse converges pointwise to T of phi inverse. This is what I was sort of alluding to in the beginning. This is called the finite section property. It doesn't always happen that if you have something invertible and you take the finite sections, it converges to that, or even if the finite sections are invertible, it converges to something that is even invertible. Um, but in this case, it does, it's well known. Uh, and it's one of the building blocks of this theory. You have to have these finite section properties. You have to know that truncation inverses go to the inverse of the whole thing. But you don't have to use H2. You can use other spaces. Yes? I was saying there is a misprint on the slide. So TNF are invertible and the inverses converge strongly to the inverse. 
in the last slide. Right? Yes, yes, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. That should be, these are invertible, and I mean the inverses converge strongly to that. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah. Okay, so if you go back and look at this thing, this is trace class, this is going strongly to the identity, these are going strongly, or their adjoints are going strongly to something. So we're in business. We can say this converges in the trace norm to that particular um, operator. So that's good. So we're kind of halfway there. We have our KN. Okay, so what about the other term? The other term, you can't do this because because of the WNs, as I said. You can still say that middle thing is trace class, but that's not good enough. So the way to get around it is to write it as IN plus KN, IN plus KN plus LN plus KN LN minus KN LN. Just, just add and subtract like you always do in analysis. And if you look at KN LN, WN converges to zero weakly and that product is trace class and hence compact. So LN converges to zero strongly. So what happens here is that this term goes to zero in the trace norm. That's what you can say. That's good because then you can write the remaining in that form, I plus KN, IN plus KN, IN plus LN. Okay, so, um, we already know what IN plus KN does. What does IN plus LN do? It doesn't do anything just sitting by itself as an operator, but when you take the determinant of it, you're fine. So IN plus LN is IN plus these, um, the WN parts. You can write W, IN is WN squared, and so now, you have something, um, so you have, to, you have to just do a little bit of algebra here. You pull out the W sub Ns, and you, you, you can then conclude, the W Ns are clearly invertible, and, and, and this is, uh, these inverses are, are uniformly bounded. So you're really in, in good shape now, and you can, um, Right, and you can, like, let's see. Yeah, so, so, so the convergence you have by, by just getting, incorporating the WNs into the, into the tilde parts, um, you're really almost there. So now, let's just finish this up. So we have this quotient, um, it is reduced to the determinant of IN plus KN times IN plus LN. We figured out what IN plus KN does. I'm just repeating what I said before. For IN plus LN, you have the same determinant, except you have these WNs, but you can move the WN to the other side, and as we did, this WN can go to here. You can put a WN squared there, so you get the tildes incorporated. So you have that this, this converges, this now converges in trace norm, so it converges to that. And you can simplify these and write them as just a product of those determinants. So, so just that little bit of determinant algebra allows this to work. Okay. All right, so. Okay, so this is our theorem. Our theorem is uh, the alpha sub j's is zero, the real part of beta j is less than a half, then this quotient converges to this determinant. So that actually does it, in a sense, because you know how each individual piece works, so all you have to do is paste everything together to get your final answer. So again, this is our approach. Um, all right, so I wanna, if, you, if your alpha j's are not zero, then you have to change spaces. You have to use weighted spaces, 
It's more complicated, but the theorem I wrote down is essentially the same theorem. In, in, in those other cases, you don't even have topless operators that are invertible unless you move things and, and fix it up. Okay. Um, but again, it's the same idea. And then I want to just say a little bit about how you get the answer, okay? Because you have to use these things over and over again. So um, again, I'm repeating what John and Alexander said. For the pure fisher hartwig singularity, we know the answer. We know it's a product of Barnes G times n to the alpha squared minus beta squared. If you translate the singularity to another value, nothing changes because you're just, you're just, you're just doing a, a, tran a simple transformation in the determinant. Determinants are the same. So that doesn't cause you any trouble. It doesn't matter if it's at zero or at some other, other point. Um, OK, so let's think about how you would build, it, build the answer. You'd start with one of the factors, and then you'd incorporate another one. And you would have to use the theorem I just wrote down but that can, be done, that can be evaluated exactly using multiplicative commutators, just the way we found the constant in the Zago theorem. So you add a factor, you get another term. You get two, pro, two factors with the Gs. You keep doing that. And then finally, you incorporate the factor that comes from the smooth symbol. And so you can see all that in the answer. You can see all the interactions of the different factors in the answer. So that's where the answer comes from. OK, so that's actually the proof in this case. And it's the way the operator theory approach to doing the singular symbols. OK. Um, all right, how much time do I have? A few more minutes? Ten minutes. Ten, ten minutes. OK, so let me go on a little bit. Yeah, eight, yeah. OK. So um, it turns out the fisher hartwig conjecture is not always true. Um, there's some obvious examples when you have integer valued uh, parameters, but um, it wasn't noticed for a long time that it wasn't true. But if you take this simple example, take um, minus one on the uh, lower part of the circle and one on the upper part, so you just have a jump function, two jumps, then um, you can calculate this determinant exactly by just moving things around and reducing it to the pure uh, Fisher-Hartwig case. And for n even, um, you get this nice answer that looks like the Fisher-Hartwig answer. But if n is odd, this matrix is skew-symmetric and all the determinants are zero. So Fisher-Hartwig can't possibly work. OK, so this is sort of the simplest non-trivial example of when it doesn't work. OK, so um, the thing to notice is for this example, there are two representations that you, that you sort of think of right away for the, for the symbol. So I think it was, you know, you write down one of these functions with the factors, but maybe there's another way to write down the same thing. And if you do it for here, for this example, you see there's two ways, so you don't even know what the answer should be. Okay. All right. So, um, and in fact, this this all this is always the case. If you if you take um, if you take your symbol and you write it as a nice function times the pure um, singularities, and I'm adding that little theta j in the notation because that's where the singularity is, then um, you can rewrite it with a slightly different phi and slightly different parameters. The alpha stay the same, but the betas change. And you can just check that if these n sub j's, these are integers, sum to 0, then phi star is this factor and what you get here is exactly the same as what you get up there. So there's, there's a countable way of representing the same thing. Okay? All right. So 
Um, here's a generalized conjecture. And um, we're not going to prove this or anything like that, but here's, here's I just wanted to mention this, OK? Um, so if you take one of your representations and you look at the power of n that you get in the answer, it's always going to be your alpha sub j's squared and your minus your beta sub j's squared. And so suppose k is just one of these representations, corresponds to an index for the representation. So what you do is look at the power that gives you the the, bit, the, the real part is the largest. You just take the max. And you look at the set where that happens. And then what the generalized conjecture says, it, modulo some technicalities, is that your asymptotics are given by the answer that you would get for that representation in this set that sort of maximizes your power plus plus smaller terms, plus these smaller terms. So that's the generalized conjecture. OK. All right, so what happens? Um, OK, so um, if there's only one element in K, then there's a unique representation that gives you this highest power. And these are the symbols for which the original conjecture should be true. And this is indeed true, and the most complete results for that were given by Torsten Earhart for this case. So if you have one singularity, Fisher-Hartwig works, because there's only one representation that gives you that highest power. But if you have, as soon as you have two jumps, then you're in the case where you have two representations. I mean, you have countable representations, but you have at least, uh, you, you, things are going to break down. And so this complicated general conjecture, now this was really proved using the Riemann-Hilbert techniques. Alexander can describe the proof. I can't. Um, and that was done um, in <clears throat> this analysis of toplitz hankel and Toplitz plus Hankel determinants with Fisher-Hartwig symbols. This is really a, a beautiful piece of work that proves the generalized conjecture. So I think that's where I'll end today. Okay. Yeah.